Hi, welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm Mary Taylor. I'm the executive director here at Chatham Marconi. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I want to welcome you and um, that we have people here and also on Zoom. So welcome to those that are on Zoom. Um, for those of you that are here, just in some housekeeping things, if you need the bathroom, it's out this back door down the hallway. Um, if you need water, our kitchen is right there. Please turn off your cell phones for the next hour so we can listen to Evan. Oh, look at everybody go. Um, and then if there's some emergency, our door is right there. We can all run out there together. <laughs> huh? Follow me. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. I'll just say go. Um, I want to personally thank Rob and Nancy Human, who, um, Rob Lydon and Nancy Human, who have put this series together. Without them, this would not be as successful as it is. So uh, my great thanks to you both. And now Rob Lydon is going to introduce the speaker for tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I'm pleased to welcome you all to the second Chatham Marconi Speaker Series presentation of 2024. Tonight's program is Underwater Robots. It's going to be an, under, an overview of underwater robotics used in research and exploration. Our speaker is C. Eben Franks has 50 years of experience, and this is a lot of experience, sailor, seaman, seagoing technician, geological engineer, geochemist, marine science educator, project manager, underwater vehicle pilot, adventurer, and ocean explorer. So he's done a few things. Between 1981 and 2002, he managed the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution's Stable Isotope Paleoclimate Lab. And during that time, he personally collected over 500 deep sea sediment cores ranging in length, get this, from a few inches to more than 100 feet. That's quite a core. In 2002, he collected the longest sediment core ever taken in the Arctic, more than 65 feet. He's performed oxygen and carbon analyses using mass spectrometry on approximately 70,000 samples spanning all the oceans in the world. This immense amount of data has provided detailed records of global climate and ocean circulation changes over the past five million years. Since beginning his career at Woods Hole in 1971, Eben has spent more than eight and a half years at sea on research vessels and offshore exploratory oil and gas platforms, including a seven-month expedition to study plate tectonics on the West African margin and in the South Atlantic. Since graduating from University of Miami, uh, in the degree in geology in 1977, Evans visited 25 countries, participated in more than 40 major expeditions from the equator to high latitudes, studying climate change, geophysics, physical oceanography, marine geology, marine biology, underwater archaeology, and deep ocean minerals exploration. There isn't much he hasn't done. During the summer of 2005, Evans was the pilot of an underwater remotely operated vehicle, ROV, on a five-week expedition in the Arctic for NOAA, and during dives as deep as 9,000 feet, dozens of new species were discovered, filmed, collected as key component of the Census of Marine Life and NOAA Hidden Ocean Arctic 2005 programs. In 2011, Eben was the scientific liaison on a major Korean research expedition in the Southwest Pacific. Six weeks of sea, millions of tons of high-grade polymetallic sulfides were discovered, sampled, documented using an oceanographic, I'm sorry, oceaneering Magnum ROV, remote operating vehicle. The value of these deposits, get this number, was estimated in the tens of hundreds of billions of dollars. A lot of money in the ocean. <clears throat> Prior to semi-retirement in 2014, Eben was Director of Solution Support for Liquid Robotics, Inc., a Sunnyvale, California-based startup company. Between 2010 and 2013, employed as an ROV project manager, sales and marketing representative at Deep Sea Systems, International Oceaneering in Katomet, Mass. He's co-founder and associate director of business development of the Blue Incubator at Blue Institute Labs in Plymouth. 
Another of his current roles is as Director of Testing for Marine Renewable Energy Collaborative's Born Tidal Test Site in the Cape Cod Canal, making power out of current. Evans multifarious, I love that word. Multifarious. Multifarious. <laughs> the interests include development of environmental monitoring sensors, exploration for seabed minerals, marine casualty investigations. That, that'd be interesting. That's great. Underwater exploration and archaeology, science education, climate change, mass spectrometry, renewable energy development, maritime domain awareness, port security, as well as emergency underground communication for the mining industry. Following the presentation, Eben will answer your questions on, on your computer if you're at home. Enter your questions at any time by clicking on the Q&A at the bottom of the screen and typing them in. I'll screen the questions both here and on Zoom and relay them to the speaker and if necessary, combining them to avoid repetition. It is now my pleasure to introduce C. Eben Franks. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. It's a real honor to be here. And uh, when I was a teenager growing up in Plymouth, I had studied a lot of uh, accounts of exploration all over the world, nonfiction tales of man against the sea. And it really inspired me, you know, as a teenager to think about finding a way to just go do big things. I wanted, most of all, I always say to get the hell out of Plymouth <laughs> and see the world. And as it turned out, one of my neighbors uh, in Plymouth was a mate on one of the Woods Hole research ships. And he says, you know, Eben, when you turn 18, we can get you on the ship for a few months if you want to try that. And uh, I started thinking about that at age 16. And I visited Woods Hole with my neighbor, Paul Howland, who eventually retired as captain of one of the ships. And Paul introduced me to the port captain and members of the ship's crew and people in the port office. And I was on the dock and when the ship came and went. And that really gave me a vision of what it might be like when I was 16 years old. And I said, sure thing, sign me up. So as soon as I graduated from high school, uh, I went to uh, Thayer Academy prep school in Braintree. And what I gained out of commuting from Plymouth to Braintree every day was knowledge I never wanted to commute 30 miles to get to any job. Uh, I just said, I've got to be out in the world uh, doing big things. So uh, when I was preparing this talk for tonight, I went through it at home with my wife and she listened very carefully and she says, you know, all you have to do is explain that first slide you're about to show after you know, the front piece, quote. Uh, she said, uh, this talk you're giving, Eben, is more or less a nostalgia trip on just a little slice of what I've done. Uh, so we're going to do this. The quote is, by Mary McCarthy in the front piece of a book called The Wager, a nonfiction tale of shipwreck and man against the sea from the 18th century, a British ship called The Wager. And all these people were shipwrecked here and there, building vessels to get off an island where the ship had gone down out of scrap wood people finding their way back to England five to ten years after the initial uh, expedition started. And they all had a different perspective, but uh, the, the knowledge and the wisdom was we are all the hero of our own story. So think about that as I go through this. I, I always say my failures shortcomings and weaknesses are legendary and well documented <laughs> and I, I've never denied that either but uh, I got a lot of his heroic tales to tell tonight so uh, for tonight only I shoehorned in a couple slides here about a trans-pacific telegraph cable route survey from 1874 um, we needed samples in our paleoclimate lab in the early 1980s from the Northwest Pacific. 
and uh, we searched all the databases of all oceanographic samples, all the repositories all over the US and some in Canada and the UK. And there was a printout, a fan fold printout, pin writer kind of thing in the basement of our building from the 50s, it must have been 60s, uh, from some defunct government agency in, in DC. And the gentleman's name that was in the archives was George Heimerdinger. Uh, wonderful, rich name. So George Heimerdinger pulls out this fan fold. He says, now what latitude, what longitude range, what water depth? And he says, okay, uh, he found four samples in this 50 or 100 page database of thousands of samples. And it had a two digit date code for when they'd been collected. And it said 74. And you know, it's just 1984. And we'd all been to sea on ships and we'd never heard of the Tuscarora. And it turns out uh, these samples were at Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. Uh, in glass vials. And the Tuscarora in 1874 had collected 450 sediment samples and little chips of rock and sand uh, on a Trans-Pacific Cable Route survey from San Francisco up along the Aleutians, down along the Japanese coast and into Yokohama over a six month period. And what, they, what was interesting about it or fascinating was they used this Belknap sounding device also called uh, Sigsby sounding device. The captain of the ship was George Belknap. And that sampling tube was lowered on piano wire. They had 80 or 90,000 feet of piano wire on a steam powered winch, uh, about maybe an eighth of an inch in diameter. And just, we got a hold of the entire log of this and culled through, list, read everything we possibly could learn about Tuscarora. Uh, what's interesting, when this thing would hit the bottom, uh, it had a little plunger that opened up and allowed mud or sand to go in. And they were very sure they hit the bottom and it would drop that 64 pound cannonball, leave the cannonball behind, just a simple little trigger. So they detect a drop off and a tension on the, on the wire. And uh, early in the cruise, they used a steam powered winch to bring the, the little tube back up and archive the sample. But later in the cruise, they're running short of coal and they realized it's taken a lot of time using a steam winch, it's pretty slow. They had the crew cranking the drum by hand to bring the samples up from 10, 12, 15,000 feet deep. And uh, they were a couple years ahead of Charles Darwin and the Beagle or the Challenger, whatever the expedition was, uh, where Darwin found a uh, phenomenally deep ocean trench, which we now know is the Challenger Deep. Uh, but they found the Kuril Trench uh, off of the Kuril Islands in Russian Far East uh, about I think 4,800 fathoms, so over 20,000 feet. And they stayed on that station day after day, lowering, hitting the bottom, and bringing it up, not believing it could possibly be that deep. So uh, it was that deep. We got a hold of samples from unnamed seamounts in the Northwest Pacific. They had just enough calcium carbonate in them that we could do radiocarbon dating of the sediments and we were doing a, a reconstruction of the climate history of the Northwest Pacific. So uh, this is just one example of uh, a typed up uh, document that was published, I think, in the 1920s where they had gone through and transcribed everything and printed it. But uh, it describes how many fathoms uh, the vial or the sample number, you can't really see too well, but hard sand. And it, to be very sure that they were getting a sample, even if it hit rock, a rocky bottom, they packed the end of that little tube with beeswax. 
So it was sticky enough that it hit, if it hit rock, there would be little rock chips stuck on there too. So they saved absolutely everything. We called Smithsonian uh, to ask about getting these four samples. And this guy, Dan Johnson at Smithsonian in 1984 says, how did you hear about this? And we said, well, George Heimendinger got this print out. And he goes, we were just about to throw those samples out. No one has ever looked at them for over 100 years. And I said, send them to us. So we got our samples, and that eventually led to funding to revisit that part of the world and continue our paleoclimate research. We were there on Soviet ships in the 90s. Uh, late 80s, we were on a joint Russian or Soviet-American expedition uh, on a ship from, I think it was University of Washington, for five or six weeks. Uh, and that cooperative agreement allowed us to eventually uh, get on the Soviet ships in 91, just before the crash of the Soviet Union. Uh, we were there as it was crumbling and barely got out and uh, got home just in time as, you know, August 10th and uh, Yeltsin is back in St. Petersburg, which is then Leningrad. Anyway, so uh, fast forward a little, little bit to... Uh, late 20th century, and I, I found this statistic online the other day looking into doing these first couple of slides. Uh, there are 440,000 miles of seabed cables, communications cables. A lot of it nowadays is fiber optic, but they're everywhere, all over the world. And the older ones from mid 20th century and older uh, are still, some of them are still viable. So uh, scientists from Woods Hole Oceanographic and Scripps uh, between Hawaii and the West Coast grappled up an old AT&T cable mm -hmm. and didn't break it. They pulled it, there's enough slack and got it all the way to the surface in 4,000 meters, whatever the water depth was, uh, and spliced in a junction box. And there's uh, a, a, a schematic or a cartoon of what that, station looks like out a thousand miles northeast of Hawaii, about 2,500 or so miles from San Francisco. And they have an on-bottom seismometer out there that's operated continuously, and it worked perfectly from the first time they ever plugged it in. Mm -hmm. And since then, there have been a lot more expeditions dredging up uh, AT&T phone cables, and plugging in seabed nodes and making place that they're a data link as well as a way to get power out to these remote sites. And uh, there are now seismometers, seabed uh, nodes where autonomous vehicles swim in and charge their batteries and dump data, and the data comes back. Uh, there's fiber optic lines off of Oregon that go out to a gigantic observatory that's got dozens of instruments and. Uh, vehicles in the water column. That's called uh, Juan de Fuca, J-U-A-N, not W-A-N-D-A, Juan de Fuca Ridge uh, Observatory. It's amazing stuff. So uh, there's the junction box on the right up here that shows, you know, where the cables were connected and the instruments went in. And they subsequently plugged ever more instruments in doing water quality environmental monitoring. But uh, this is just the beginning uh, of seabed observatories and persistent data collection on the bottom of the ocean. So uh, we're going to go on to, uh, and when I did this for my wife, I read each line saying, this is what we're going to talk about tonight. And I was very calm and very deliberate. Uh, she said, Eben, no, just <laughs> let everybody look at this and absorb it. And in each one of the slides, or almost all of them have the, the title on them. Okay, let me know when you're ready. It's all right? Okay, kick it ahead. Oops, back it up. Back it up. There we are. Okay. At the most basic level nowadays, uh, 
we teach underwater robotics to kids from middle school on up uh, through college level and beyond sometimes. Uh, I've been teaching this advanced studies and leadership program at Mass Maritime every summer for seven years. Uh, and I volunteered for 10 years before that, teaching that class, bringing in small ROVs to demonstrate for the kids in the pool, let the kids drive a real so-called ROV. And uh, I've also been very much involved with these MATE ROV competitions. M-A-T-E is Marine Advanced Technology Education. So we've had as many as 25 or 30 teams from middle school and high school level uh, come to our competitions. They've been at UMass Dartmouth, Mass Maritime, Sandwich STEM Academy. We bop them around depending where we get the best deal from administration on facility fee, meaning you give it to us for free or we'll take it someplace else. So uh, I've done that for 17 years and we've found a wonderful home at Mass Maritime. They're phenomenally accommodating uh, letting us use their facility, not just the pool, but conference rooms. The, the students in these mate competitions uh, spend four or five or six months working on uh, the tasks that are representative of real uh, questions and projects in the deep ocean that organizations use robotic vehicles for. So we have world-leading experts that help us develop the challenge or the missions every year. And about 100 uh, or so volunteers flood in for the international competition where we have uh, 600 students from all over the world, teams from Egypt and China and Russian Far East and uh, all over the Pacific, Singapore. Uh, so there are pictures here of high school and college level ROVs, you would look at this and say, that's gotta be college, university level, right? Well, this is uh, a, a team, a high school team from uh, California called Jesuit Robotics. They're, you know, Jesuit school in Carmichael, California. Uh, the guys up there in the orange T-shirts with their orange ROV, a high school from Connecticut, and that was their third year competing, and they won our regional and went on to phenomenally great glory uh, at the international competition. So that is in Seattle, Tacoma, that international, but we've done it at NASA Neutral Buoyancy Lab. Uh, we've done it at University of Hawaii, I think it was Hilo, I can't remember, but Newfoundland, we bop the international around every year. And the most fun place to do the international competition, you would think, oh, hey, pretty fun to go to Houston, go to Hawaii. But we absolutely loved Eastern Tennessee uh, ETSU, uh, Eastern Tennessee State University in Johnson City, Tennessee. They could not be better. They are phenomenal how supportive they are. The Eastman Foundation, Eastman Kodak, has a gigantic industrial complex near there, and they shovel money into the mate competitions and just do a phenomenal effort to support that. So these are generally high school, there's Texas A&M's entry at the international a year or two ago. And the, the, the challenges are so complicated and complex, but achievable by teams that have built ROVs for two or three years and now a lot of 3D printed parts. So early ROVs, uh, this is from 1953, happened to be the year I was born, uh, but that uh, the Poodle, as you might imagine, was originated in France with a name like the Poodle. Um, and it had a camera and they got that down to seven or 800 feet deep and they got uh, video images back, very grainy, you know, uh, probably 50 lines of resolution at best, black and white, but they get it on a shipwreck and looked at a couple shipwrecks with the thing. And that was, it's now recognized as the very first one. And there's this underwater scooter 
Uh, if you look at it, you can see it's got Japanese characters on the, on the uh, control surfaces, a handle where the diver would hold onto it and scoot around. So it must have been battery, probably carbon batteries in there, but it had lights and a camera and that would allow divers to zip around underwater. Pretty neat thing. Uh, so we have micro ROVs, you know, real basic simple things uh, uh, that are available as kits. Uh, on the top left is called Open ROV. Open ROV, it's about a two or $3,000 kit that hobbyists and high schools can buy. And <coughs> they <coughs> have the capability to have manipulators uh, multiple cameras, multiple lights, put environmental sensors on them. Uh, whatever the, the, the student group or the class or a place like the Marconi Center wanted to add to a, an open ROV it can be done with external ports and a data channel to come back to the surface. They, the, uh, all the weight is at the bottom in, in battery packs in, those, in the skid. So, they're controlled with a very small diameter tether, smaller in diameter than a pencil, uh, which is just ethernet in that case, but you can also get other small ROVs that have fiber optic and have much higher bandwidth for you know, multiple color HD cameras. So that's not uncommon nowadays. Uh, there's one in the middle, it's called the Blue Eye, and it was just such a, a neat image uh, I've never actually seen one in l real life, but they are advertised here and there, Blue Eye. Uh, there was a company, a startup company, the top right and bottom left and the bottom, uh, the red tag sale, I call it. This was Aquabotics over in Fall River. Uh, Martin Street, there's that big business incubator in one of the old mill buildings, and Aquabotics got a bunch of startup money and produced probably a few hundred of these Endura 100s and 300s, meaning it dived to 100 meters or 300 meters, depending how long the tether was. And it was all based on Raspberry Pi, Arduino, you know, hobbyist basically microprocessor that you can get for 15 or 20 or 30 bucks. Uh, and all the code was written for that and open source, so they would always be happy to loan out an aquabotics for a demonstration for school groups. So I was over there, I heard about free, free demo, borrow, yes. So I got uh, a couple times a year, I'd borrow an aquabotics that they finally said, you know, you could just keep that one. Uh, and eventually uh, it happened, they went into uh, higher production numbers at some fabrication shop up I think in New Hampshire if I get this whole story right. And the first 10 or 15 boards didn't work right, need a lot of rework, and they produced another 50 and then another 100. And so uh, what we came to realize was that the Raspberry Pi Arduino microprocessor based controller for the thrusters, lights, cameras, all the peripheral stuff, if you spiked it with a power spike, it would blow a hole in the memory and corrupt. And no matter what you did, you could reload it. And my friend Bradshaw and I struggled to get one of these resurrected copy uh, working software, all the code onto a laptop. It's actually on this laptop. And we got all the code from the company and all the vehicles they were building were coming back inoperative. And that's why there's 12 or 13 of them on the shelves here with one darn thing or another wrong with each of them. And finally, uh, the investors in the company said, you guys are done. It's just enough. We've shoveled enough money in there. So uh, uh, as I said, I'm the hero of every tale I tell lately. Uh, they called me up and said, Eben, we've got 13 vehicles plus miles of all the different tethers and pelican cases. Uh, you know anybody would want these? And so I just grabbed my car keys, hit the remote start out the window. I said, I'll be there in a half hour. So I loaded my, my van up, 
and brought a bunch of that home. I ended up with three of them, uh, and people I knew at Bristol Community College got a couple of them for free. Uh, we just made sure they all got out. And that the little one in the case worked for a couple of years. I did probably 15 demos with it, but it started getting squirrely and then finally choked, and uh, it's now uh, an ornament. <laughs> Uh, object of wonder. So uh, for a while I worked at, after I left Woods Hole Oceanographic, the funding went in Paleo Climate Lab from very high level to nothing overnight pretty much. So uh, with kids growing up and I could see college expenses, I said, hat, rabbit, where's the rabbit? I got to pull a rabbit out of this hat and find a place to work. So uh, like so many people that leave Woods Hole Oceanographic, they went to Benthos, which became Teledyne Benthos, which is now Teledyne Marine, or some of the other companies around there. So I went through a couple of revolving doors in that part of the Cape. Uh, I spent, I think, four or five years at Benthos, about the time they rolled out the Stingray ROV, and 300 meter depth, multiple cameras, and uh, eventually, as it turned out, multiple problems. Uh, so, uh, it turns out uh, the thrusters on these were Technodyne thrusters, one horsepower, put out a lot of, you know, a lot of thrust, marvelous. But if you didn't slow them down gently, they would produce back EMF and zap the control system. And it was just all these attempts at fixing it that went on for years. Uh, we eventually developed the uh, mini rover here, uh, which used the same control system, same thrusters, and that would literally jump out of the water. It was so fast. We demonstrated that in the canal, Cape Cod Canal, at four knots, and we could swim against the four knot current with that mini rover. And so we're pretty proud of that. And if you look at the, the frame on that one on the top left, it's got the Teledyne logo. We thought that might get us in the good graces of the overlords out in California. Uh, no, they killed it. Um, but uh, before they killed it, uh, I sold a couple of them in Russia to a company, one for a company that was uh, looking for unexploded ordnance and had done it all with divers. So all these Russians come to our the shop at, at Benthos to get their training on how to run the thing, how to maintain it. And they're all maimed, I swear to God, every one of them had, you know, part of that gone or part of this gone from things that had blown up in close proximity. So they really wanted one of these and we sold them, or I sold them one. Uh, I sold another one to uh, Murmansk, is how everybody pronounces it, but it's actually pronounced Mordomansk, uh, northernmost Russia up on the Finnish border. border. Uh, the uh, Mordomansk Marine Biological Institute, MMBO, and they were likewise looking for radioactivity in sediments up around northern Russia where other stuff had been dumped. So uh, that, we hooked them up with all these sensors and I, I took this other one, the bottom left, over to easternmost China, uh, Dalian University of Technology, DUT, and they really wanted to have this cable pipe and cable tracking sensor bolted on and tested it. So they had a gigantic tow tank from must have been the 40s or 50s with all these ship models. Uh, just stunning, the models of all these freighters and trawlers that they had carved out of wood and painted, you know, I mean, beautiful things displayed around this ancient tow tank. And we just ran this around in the tank and they got their videos and they eventually bought it. But, uh, and the bottom right is multiple cameras and a blue, blue view imaging sonar, uh, you know, front and rear. So that was used for scallop research with Kunamesset Farm Foundation. Uh, we chased scallop dredges with it and uh, chased sea turtles to make sure sea turtles weren't being eaten by scallop dredges so that they could counter uh, the 50 lawyers and the one scientist at Oceana uh, that was suing the scallop industry. And they were successful in 
providing, well, were part of providing the scientific data that showed turtles would follow the dredge across the bottom, and when the bottom gets disturbed, the turtles say, that's the dinner bell, and they were down there scarfing up stuff that was chewed up and busted by the dredge, and the turtles would also follow the scallop boats as they were shucking what they had collected. And so we documented all that with these ROVs for Kunamesset Farm and uh, Ron Smolowitz over there. Anybody ever hear of him? Fascinating guy. Uh, I recommend getting over to Hatchville and visit the Kunamesset Farm. They do the most amazing stuff. Uh, anyway, there we were, as I commonly say. These are inspection class. Uh, other uh, Teledyne bought out the green, greenish ones here. Uh, a company called Seabotics, uh, originally was based in California. And uh, I think they, got, they bought the company and then realized there's too much competition in these small inspection class vehicles. Uh, Video Ray has sold tens of thousands of those uh, vehicles in the top left. They used to be available at West Marine for hobbyists and people who want to put them in their hot tubs and do whatever else. God knows what people are doing with them. But uh, they were very popular, five, six thousand bucks for the cheap ones. And then they get up to 80 or 90 thousand dollars for those little things that would just twitch through the water like a wounded fish. Uh, but we were up against Video Ray and all these other companies putting out these small inspection vehicles for all of these big government contracts with the Army Corps of Engineers for inspecting dams and with the Navy trying to find an exploded ordnance. It just was relentless having to fly here, go there, do all these demos, train people. Uh, the top right and the bottom right are two views of the blue robotics. That's also a, a very popular hobbyist kit. Uh, and those are available basic level for about 5,000 bucks. You build them yourself, do a lot of soldering and machining and assembly work, but you end up with something that'll go to a couple hundred meters. Really a fascinating thing. Uh, so the previous slide, let's go back up one. This one in the bottom in the middle is a tricked out uh, Bento Stingray uh, that I just sold to a company up in Maine, the uh, Bristol Marine Science and Survey bought that. He bought a beautiful truck, bought all the best stuff for his Stingray. And I, he kept saying, you know, if you hear of any jobs, I can take the Stingray out on, just let me know. And anytime I got a call, I say, okay, call, call Brian Ackerman. Uh, he's now captain of one of the vessels out at uh, Moss Landing Marine Lab. But uh, he had moved to Maine, set this thing up, and he, he went all over the world with it. And so uh, one, one opportunity came in from Woods Hole, uh, just down the road from uh, Benthos in North Falmouth. And they said, uh, we've got a seismometer stuck on the bottom near Grenada. And I said... Oh yeah, okay, I'll call Brian. And I, I got authorized to go with Brian Ackerman, work on the uh, Seward Johnson research vessel out of Harbor Branch in Florida. And we met the ship in Grenada, flew all the Brian stuff down there, air freighted it, of course, as you might expect, got stuck in customs. And the ship had to leave and somehow it all came out of customs at the last possible moment before we had to load it on the ship and go. But the seismometer was stuck in 700 feet of water and had been attached to a surface float, communications float. And uh, how much more time have I got? 15? More 20. Okay, great. We're going to make it. Uh, and someone had vandalized the buoy within a month at a time. It was all put in, in place. So the seismometer is down there recording, and there was all these other mooring components that held the cable for it up off the bottom in two or 300 feet below the surface. But there's you know heavier parts of the mooring cable that had sunk back to the bottom. So seismometer here, uh, cable coming up with undersea flotation, and then the top of that cable is stuck in the mud down there. So we 
went down there with this stingray, there's a hook on here uh, with a piece of spectra line. Uh, it was about the diameter of my little finger, but had 25,000 pound breaking strength. Incredibly strong stuff, just on a spool this big. So we, uh, in the next slide, you can see we put the thing, uh, a down weight, t taped the tether to the cable for that big heavy weight, couple of train wheels or big chunks of cast iron. And uh, uh, lowered the heavy weight, launched the ROV, t went to the bottom and got the seismometer on the sonar. You could just see it. And so we had about 100 feet of tether between the weight and the ROV. And we could get about this close to the seismometer. <laughs> And to get that last 15 feet, we had to reposition the ship. We kept everything there, but their live boating, you know, the, the captain, George Gunther, uh, powerful magic that guy had to get that ship moved over 20 or 30 feet to where we could just go over and bang against the seismometer with a hook, trying, trying, trying. And eventually uh, we clipped in and we were heroes for about 20 minutes, mm -hmm. 20 minutes. And one darn thing after another. Uh, so we start pulling up on that down weight and uh, we're watching, we see the seismometer come off the bottom and the vehicle starts getting dragged around and then the camera and the sonar, everything goes dead. Mm. And we're saying, we just shredded the tether. And uh, so this is 650 feet deep by this point. Uh, but we've got the seismometer. And as you'll see in the picture, I, th I just can't see it here. But uh, uh, I said, stay calm. Everybody on deck, we make the ROV positively buoyant so that when it, you bust the tether, it's going to float up. We just get everybody looking for it. Mm -hmm. And we hauled up, get the seismometer, and just before the seismometer broke the surface, the ROV floats up 100 feet behind. <laughs> and the tethers, you know, wrapped around. So uh, just tangled up enough in all the rigging that we got a hold of that, dragged the ROV back. Uh, we were supposed to do other work in the volcano. It was a volcanic crater. Right, I'm supposed to do other work in the crater the next day for a volcanologist named Herolder Sigurdsson. Everybody, anybody ever hear of Herolder? Uh, very famous volcanologist, studied Santorini and looking for Atlantis and all that, you know, National Geographic, Discovery Channel kind of guy. Uh, so he's on, on the ship waiting for his six hours of ROV time to go poke around, sample the mud, sample the gases and the water in the crater, and tether's busted. And, you know, he's checking up on us, you know, you get it, you, will it work tomorrow? Uh, I don't think so. And, because uh, we, we could have, we had everything we needed to splice the tether, but it was 24 hours of curing to make the splice uh, waterproof and not fail. So he uttered the words I never thought I would hear. I only heard that one time in my life. Uh, as we get in, I said, Heralder, how are you doing? He goes, uh, not so well. This is a very expensive trip, and I got nothing. And then he says, I don't think you guys tried hard enough. <laughs> and I was saying, well, we didn't have time. We, we would have fixed it if we could. Anyway, so research RVs, much bigger, uh, deep sea systems, on the left side, there's the Woods Hole, Jason. Uh, we've used that for a bunch of uh, projects. The one in the bottom middle is Subastion. Subastion for uh, Schmidt Ocean Institute. That goes to 6,000 or 6,500 meters. Um, I literally chased the people from Schmidt Ocean Institute, the director of science operations, chased them all over the world, tried to get a meeting with them. Where he said, okay, if you meet me in Perth, Australia, next week, uh, you know, I'm sitting in the office in Katamit. He says, you know, if you can get to Perth by Friday next week, I'll meet you there. You know, I'm going to, but I've got to go elsewhere. So I go to Perth, and we had like an hour. 
And, uh, and he says, now, I want you to meet the people on the ship. And the ship was still in a shipyard, a German shipyard. The ship was refit in a German shipyard for two and a half years at the rate of you know, this many thousand dollar bills every day. Uh, Eric, Eric and Wendy Schmidt, uh, Google, Fortune, so every time you do this, it's another buck for them. Uh, and if you do that, that's three bucks every time you click your mouse. So they have unlimited funding for their vessel. We really wanted to get our uh, Max Rover on to the research ship with Schmidt Ocean Institute, but they could never commit to it, ended up building their own 30 or $40 million vehicle, which has been really successful, I have to say. Uh, and bottom right is uh, University of Connecticut, Avery Point. We took that one out to Stellwagen Bank and looked at the Palmer and the Crary, a couple schooners that collided in 1902 or three, and are out there near the Portland. And uh, top right is, oh, that's, uh, Institute for Exploration, IFE, Bob Ballard's group over at URI, Mystic, Connecticut, and that part of the world. Uh, AUVs, Autonomous Underwater Vehicles, they're shallow and deep ones. Uh, so this is, oh, didn't jump. There we are. This is the most famous AUV in the world. Uh, you might recognize that. It was attacked by a great white shark uh, and thrashed around. It's got tooth marks on it. It was on display at Woods Hole uh, for a couple of years in Exhibit Center. And people would come and take pictures and rub their hands on it. But uh, that was all over Shark Week on Discovery Channel for years, every summer, whenever they talk about it. And that's, uh, anybody recognize the guy on the right? Yeah, a local legend, Greg Scomel. So uh, interesting guy, a lot of fun to talk to. Uh, the top left is the I think a 200 meter capable REMUS, Remote Environmental Monitoring Underwater System, REMUS built by, originally by Hydroid, uh, and it was originally developed for the Navy through Woods Hole Oceanographic, and uh, my former boss at Deep Sea Systems never forgave Woods Hole for letting that get out the door and these four guys form Hydroid. Uh, we heard about that a couple times a week from Chris Nicholson at Deep Sea Systems. He was always bitter uh, that he didn't get a shot at taking over and, you know, developing his company like that. But uh, the bottom left is their most modern iteration of the Remus. And you can see it's got a, a drone that will drop it, uh, you know, fly it out, drop it. Actually can pick it up and bring it back out of the water. Uh, kind of a neat thing. And so gliders, these have no propellers generally, although there now is a variant that has a propeller for occasional use. But these change their buoyancy and glide down through the water. There's a diagram there. And they'll go about a half a knot or one and a half knots down through the water column to a thousand meters or whatever, taking readings every couple of seconds, record all that data, get to that depth and change the pitch and change the buoyancy and they'll float back up. They get to the surface and sit there at the surface for a couple hours and chit chat with a satellite, uh, talk to the people back home and say, where do I go now? And so this wonderful tale, a wonderful program at Rutgers University uh, down in New Jersey, uh, called Are You Cool? Rutgers, Rutgers University Coastal and Ocean Observatory Lab or something like that. Are You Cool? Wonderful hats. Uh, but they have undergraduate students, 18, 19 year old kids that piloted these gliders, one of these gliders across the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and it's just a, a really inspiring movie called uh, Atlantic Voyage, I think, something like that. Uh, very inspiring tale. So if you've got grandkids or kids that are aging in to thinking about college and want to do a really big thing, I recommend Rutgers University and their Are You Cool program. But uh, the yellow ones here are Slocum gliders. They're built by Teledyne Marine or Teledyne Webb in North Falmouth and West Falmouth. 
We get some deep diving, long endurance AUVs, good to 6,000 meters, uh, big and little and fast and extremely capable. You get an idea of some of the sensors on there. Uh, there's cameras, there's sub-bottom profiling, there's side scan sonar, forward looking stuff. Uh, a lot of electronic magic going on uh, for underwater surveillance, acoustics, uh, listening for things, chasing after things, and following things for the Navy and environmental monitoring. So the, just some interesting representations of how some of these AOVs use sonar to map seafloor structures, uh, chase after pipelines, inspect pipelines to make sure they're not buried too deeply or exposed by shifting uh, sediments along the bottom. Uh, fascinating stuff. So you remember aquabotics, right? Aquabotics, uh, Jason uh, Webster and Ian Estefan Owen, J-A-I-A, -A, have come up with a new plan and they are really successful. They have these uh, robotic vehicles. You can see them holding one uh, tiny little thing about this big, very lightweight, and has one thruster and batteries that go, uh, uh, it'll drive the thing at 12 knots for a full day uh, on the surface. And they talk to each other when they're at the surface and they're configured with different instruments to do different things. So if this one over here s sniffs something, uh, it'll send a signal to this other one and call it over and this one will come over and uh, use its uh, chemical sensor. So they're used for environmental monitoring. They have towed uh, hydrophones with it for chasing after whales and doing stuff for the Navy. Uh, but what's interesting, when they get to a site where they want to profile a waterway or something, find something in the water, uh, they self-organize at 50 meters distance apart uh, over a big array. You might have 10 or 12 or 20 of them. And then they reverse and pull themselves down very slowly through the water column. And all that data is accumulating very rapidly in their sensors. So they're basically a little instrument platform. But they're it's likewise open source. And they sold a whole bunch to the University of Delaware and a bunch more to US Geological Survey for environmental monitoring. But the Navy is really, really interested in these things too, because they can characterize uh, the seabed for uh, littoral uh, landings, let's call it a combat zone, uh, drive the things ashore, get, drop off Navy SEALs, figure out what the bottom's like, what the acoustic properties are, are of the water. So there's just two of them diving down here. They back up and dive to the bottom. Uh, the accelerometers allow it to uh, figure out if it's a sandy or muddy bottom or a rocky bottom just by how hard it hits the bottom when it, hits, it, it tags the bottom. Really fascinating stuff. So these guys are really successful. Uh, wave gliders, liquid robotics. I worked with this company for a couple of years before I was, uh, I always say, drop kicked into retirement, uh, 2015 or so. Uh, but by then I was really tired, burnt unit, too much time on airplanes, ships, meetings, Sales meetings, engineering meetings, just literally about killed me. Uh, so they took really good care of me. I love the place and I really admire what they came up with. So these wave gliders have a propulsion unit down below. And as the vehicle floats up and down on the surface, uh, the propulsion unit is pulled through up and down through the water. And those veins flop up and down like Venetian blinds. And uh, we sent four of these across the Pacific uh, in 10 or 11 months when I was with the company. Two went to Australia and two went to Japan. Well, one of them got run over and never got recovered, but uh, uh, two did make it to Australia and the third one failed. It got so fouled with uh, uh, gooseneck barnacles that it just crapped out after 14, 15 months near Japan, but it wasn't worth going to get. But they transmit data continuously 
It's a, likewise a platform for whatever sensors you can imagine you might want to uh, put on something and get data out of the ocean. <coughs> they communicate via satellite, they communicate with each other, they can be out there in swarms. But this is a quick graphic on how they work. Uh, you see the veins flopping up and down. Uh, we had video, wonderful video, where some knuckleheads in a little outboard motorboat 25 miles off the coast of Hawaii tried to kidnap one. Uh, mm -hmm. They have cameras on them. Some of them do. And we uh, actually it was digital stills. So these guys came up, happened to see it, swimming along at a knot or two, you know, bouncing up and down the waves. And so these guys said, oh, let's go grab that. Uh, it's got solar panels. And so they pulled it aboard the boat, a little 20, 25 foot outboard, and it starts pulling the boat sideways, backwards. And they're going, it's pictured like this. And they're like trying to hold onto it. But the propulsion unit has 300 pounds of thrust every time it bounces up on 300 pounds. And that'll drag a, a little boat sideways. And uh, we, used, we used to be obliged to go to Hawaii once a year for sales meetings. And you know, it's on the Kona coast, it just, it had to be done. But uh, every year they would take us all out, you know, six or eight people at a time from the Sunnyvale office or my home office here on the Cape uh, to swim with a wave glider. So they take you out five miles offshore, chase a wave glider around, you get to get underwater pictures and hold on to it and have it pull you through the water. It's pretty fun. And I love the, the guy's name here, Art Money, former Assistant Secretary of Defense, but he basically says it'll do whatever you want it to do. Uh, and they made a lot of money, but eventually got bought out by Boeing. So that's the uh, Trans-Pacific uh, route of the expedition, PAC-X, 2,250,000 data points, 33,000 miles, four wave gliders, 300 days. How much time we got? Minutes? Okay, good. We're getting there. Uh, autonomous surface vehicles, a lot of these around now. Uh, this bottom right one is a guy that was working at Liquid Robotics when I was there, and he started a company called Blue Trail Engineering, and this is a hobbyist autonomous surface vehicle. Uh, he rode, uh, drove this one Hawaii to New Zealand, uh, measurement all the way, talking to satellites, and uh, they haven't started selling it yet, but they are going to develop it into a product that people like us or, you know, high schools or colleges can buy and uh, hook up whatever you want to plug in and send it off on its mission. So pretty neat stuff. But there are all these variants nowadays, mostly electric powered, but some of these have diesel engines uh, that charge batteries, you know, a couple hours at a time and then run on electricity the rest of the time. And some of these can stay out for weeks, months. Uh, I don't know if they've done a years yet with AUVs like this, surface view, ASVs. Uh, you might have seen these in the news here or there. Uh, long endurance. These things have crossed the Atlantic. Uh, wind power alone. And they're fast and very capable, can be directed hour by hour or pre-programmed to go do a mission and they'll do whatever you want to do out in the ocean, uh, get video and sonar and environmental monitoring likewise. Uh, good sonar imagery, uh, some examples of what you can do with surface vehicles or AUVs underwater vehicles with the right kind of uh, imaging. And there's a sub bottom profile looking at that ridge complex there. Uh, compared to what the multi-beam imaging sonar found when it got down there. You know, the, the multi-beam is just penetrating the bottom using sound, looking at the layers of rock and mud within the bottom. Uh, so you can see some structures, but, uh, the, you know, they put false color images on there uh, to make it look really dramatic. So uh, I went to a conference called Rex of the World. There are three million shipwrecks worldwide. And there are about a million or a million and a half from the 20th century that are of most interest because they're the ones that have all the petrochemicals and then industrial chemicals on or a lot of them and are leaking. And other ones have incredible amounts of 
valuable stuff, you know, gold and platinum and whatever. So a lot of interest in getting out there and finding them and mapping them. Uh, I was on this thing the first week that I worked for uh, Benthos. The, you know, I was supposed to train for a month at Benthos before I got sent out in the field, learn how to run the ROV. And they come to me on Friday at the end of the first week, said, oh, uh, uh, can you be in North Carolina on Monday? Uh, we'll ship it down there. You're doing fine. Um, so I said, sure. So we went down and looked for the alligator. We never found it. Uh, it's a Navy's first sub, human powered. It originally had oars. And you imagine in a six foot, seven foot diameter tube with people sweating away on oars. Uh, but it had a scrubbing system to get CO2 out of the atmosphere. It had a diver lockout. Uh, they had ways of delivering explosives and screwing them into the wooden hull of a ship. Uh, so uh, the marine archaeologist, legendary guy named Mike Overfield with NOAA. Mike Overfield studied this and a bunch of others. Uh, and he went out to the site. We were out with our ROV, never found a thing. We had a Navy uh, uh, Remus vehicle out there. Nav Oceano, we look, 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 never found it. But Mike Overfield went out with the Navy NR1 nuclear research sub. It had 40, 50 people on it. Uh, and he came back and talked about what they had found that summer uh, at a meeting in Philadelphia, like that in November, we went to the meeting. And he didn't say anything, but he put up one slide that showed flat bottom, and then this round lump. He didn't say anything about that slide, but he, we're all confident that he found it. But then the guy goes and dies like three months later. Uh, you know, smoker, he lived a, a dolce vita, but it killed him, sadly. So we, uh, friends of mine and I chased after the stellar daisy, uh, very large ore carrier that was converted from crude to carrying ore from Brazil to China. Uh, had 266,000 tons of iron ore. Uh, it left uh, the port in Brazil. Uh, it's a privately owned company. There's no authority inspecting the ships when they're loaded, how they're loaded. Uh, there's no government authority keeping track of anything having to do with all the stuff going out. Uh, so when this ship left Brazil on this ill-fated trip in early March 2017, a couple of the crew members texted back to their families, were very concerned the ship is listing five degrees leaving port. So it wasn't loaded properly. And six or eight days out, uh, must have been more than that, ten days out, uh, the, uh, they radioed back, they're having trouble. The ship uh, healed over at 25, 30 degrees, broke up, and two survivors that managed to get out on deck uh, and jumped into a life raft. So having done work with the Korean government, prior to that, they called us and asked if we could get someone, had to be from Woods Hole, uh, to go and find the ship. And I said, well, yeah, I know a guy just retired. And so he and I and two other people put the, you know, we chased this for two years. Proposals, meeting with Koreans, going to Korea, them coming here. And it eventually went to Ocean Infinity because we didn't have a $250,000 bond. Uh, my partner in this calls up and he says, oh, you hear this, Evan? They want 250,000 bucks. How much you got? And I pull out my wallet. Uh, I got about $38, I think. And he had a couple hundred. So we didn't get it. But Ocean Infinity went and found the ship, got the voyage data recorder, uh, recovered some stuff from the ship, uh, enough to satisfy the Koreans. But they got stiffed by five or six million bucks. Uh, one of those funny things. Would have ruined us. But uh, I worked with the FBI in Miami, sold them an ROV. Uh, we did real life, you know, CSI Miami, found a bunch of plastic explosive uh, grenade launchers in a canal near Florida's Turnpike uh, in Lantana Boulevard, Palm Beach County. Uh, everybody has to do something. 
So uh, we, this part of 125 pounds of plastic explosive that had been stolen from the Navy a weapons depot 10 years earlier, eight years earlier, uh, along with grenade launchers. And someone randomly drove a stolen car into that canal on top of the stuff that had been sitting there for who knows how long. And the tow truck driver pulls the car out, you know, ordinary stolen car stuck in the muck, 11 o'clock at night, no big deal. Police had been there, oh yeah, well, it's stolen last week. Uh, so police all leave, and the, the tow truck driver says, what the heck is that? And it was a uh, grenade launcher and plastic explosive and debt cord wrapped around the axle. Uh, so they called everybody back, FBI, and I went down the next day and we had to train the FBI how to use their ROV. They never had time to take the training. Mm. One of those funny things. Anyway, mm. uh, there's free trade journals that I recommend people sign up for. Uh, I give this a list like this out to every school group I, I meet with. And these are uh, print editions as well as weekly online editions about sea technology, ocean news, marine link, marine log. ECO Magazine is particularly wonderful print edition, lots of wonderful colors and graphics, but any of these will give you an idea of what's going on in underwater robotics, research, exploration, where the money is, what the Navy's doing, what NASA's doing, uh, fascinating stuff. And uh, they're all free. You just find them online, sign them up, and they'll start piling up in your email and mailbox. And read them when you eat your Wheaties. So uh, that was me 25, 30 years ago, and I'm ready for questions. But I seriously am hard of hearing. Thank you. Just a, re a reminder to the folks uh, at home, uh, click on Q&A at the bottom of the screen. Asking a question is easy. Just type in the question. I do have a couple. Let's so, hear it. Okay, the first one is, what do you know about attempts to take images of the recently discovered pl a plane that may be Amelia Earhart's? Ah, fascinating. It sure looks like the, uh, what was the make of? Electra. Electra, yeah. It sure looked like an Electra. Uh, that was in, what, 5,000 meters of water, I think. Uh, they missed Howland Island by 100 miles, I gather, if it in fact is that plane. Uh, so I can't remember if it was east or west of the island, but they must have run out of fuel just before getting to Howland Island, which was their objective. Uh, but, you know, when visibility is bad and you're in an aircraft, it's really tough to see down to the surface and find a little speck of an island. Uh, used to fly in helicopters a lot on the oil and gas industry in the 70s, and uh, it scared the bejabbers out of me to be out of sight of land, 70 miles offshore in 50, 60 mile an hour wind, bouncing around in these little Bell Jet Rangers or MBB, you know, Messerschmitt, Messerschmitt Bolkow Blom uh, helicopters. Uh, or even the big Pumas. We, we get a lot of helicopter, a lot of near misses, but uh, it's likely that that's the plane and they'll get out there a year or two from now with an ROV and get, get eyeballs on it and confirm it. Do you yes. have any questions from the audience? Yeah. Yes. So uh, the you want to repeat the question. Yeah. Answer. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, please. Yeah. So the question is: uh, the, Are the uh, autonomous vehicles uh, pre-programmed, or uh, do they have to be controlled all the time? So the wave gliders, uh, liquid robotics, used to have a control center in Sunnyvale, California, that was manned or personed. I have to say, in this day and age, uh, 24 hours a day and they might have 100 or 150 vehicles out, and they're pre-programmed, generally speaking, and can be launched from the shore and go out 200 miles or 1,000 miles and do their little thing and then come back in. But they also can be monitored continuously, and they'll send an alert if something happens. Uh, if they get run over by a ship, uh, there's a GPS transponder, if they get flipped over, 
It'll send just enough of a text message to say it's upside down, but this is where it is if you want to go get it. So uh, nowadays, uh, more modern ones, uh, the gliders when they come to the surface are redirected each time they surface. And uh, as I said, they don't generally have propellers. Uh, so that's all satellite link. And closer to shore, they might use other means of communication, but generally a satellite. And uh, the small AUVs, uh, they throw them off the beach uh, and have a laptop that has software to program 10 or 15 or 20 of those small AUVs to go do the mission. And they'll just go do, throw them off the dock. Do they use tether or Wi-Fi or how do they control them? Uh, they are, it's all Wi-Fi when they're above the water and, you know, close enough to shore. And this other... Uh, uh, communication schemes as acoustic modems, so they can talk to each other underwater acoustically, uh, low bandwidth, but still you, enough data to go through. And they'll go talk to uh, seabed nodes uh, or talk to each other at the surface or talk to a surface vessel. Uh, it, if you can imagine it, someone has thought of a way to pre-program and have these little things report in. And there's, it's a golden age. There's so much brain power, so many people coming up with ideas on how to make these things happen. Anybody else? We have a, a comment <clears throat> from uh, Doug Barnum. Very interesting. Uh, he was at Autech uh, on Andros back in the late 60s. Uh, it, it, Autech is an underwater acoustic range where they yep. do things like test submarines. Uh, Used to have uh, Larry Mertens come down from Cape Kennedy to do undersea testing. I think it was the Alvin he brought. Uh, this presentation showed an entirely different area of undersea exploration. Yep. Uh, very interesting. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Glad to do it. Anyone else? Yes. This may be a little off topic, but since we're a Marconi station. Yes. Uh, when you go down, when you, when you use an autonomous vehicle yep. to go look at one of these undersea cables yep. and you find a problem, how do you fix it? That's one of the world's great questions. Let me, let me repeat the question. Yep, go ahead. Okay, so you use a UAV and you find a problem with a cable. How do you fix it? So they would identify very precisely what the issue is, maybe get a few images of it with an AUV yeah. uh, and map it with a sonar. Uh, if you see the cable exposed, high above the, the sand or rock or sediment. Uh, and they'll come to the surface and say, uh, you better get out there and fix this uh, via satellite or Wi-Fi if it's a ship nearby or other means of communication when they're at the surface. Uh, but then you'll have to go out with a ship and an ROV and you know really look at it, try and figure out how to bury it deeper or uh, excavate it so it's shallower and not being yanked and busted. So uh, it ultimately requires an ROV with work class capability. Uh, I didn't mention, but oceaneering, deep sea systems oceaneering has over a thousand work class ROVs worldwide, a thousand of them. You know, you got one Jason, you got one deep sea systems uh, Max Rover. There are a thousand vehicles worth from five to 30 or 40 million bucks each out there doing the most amazing gosh darn things in the, in the world's oceans with all these tools that can pick things up and cut open ships and uh, you know recover stuff. Uh, it's the most great, uh, a lot of oil and gas, that's what has driven it originally. Uh, how are we doing? We have a question. Um do you see any potential, oh, Jim DiMarzio asks, do you see any potential for using AI with AUVs? That's a big part of what's going on now is uh, being able to look at uh, sonar images, video, digital stills, and interpreting what's happening uh, and machine learning. So that's a big part now of being able to uh, evaluate seafloor structures, uh, characterize 
uh, objects that are floating or cruising around in the water. So a lot of that going on, and I don't know much about it, but that is a huge part of the, the things I read about when I'm barely awake in the morning. I, w I want to thank you very much, Evan, for coming uh, tonight to speak with us. Um, there are more questions which maybe we can deal with offline. If you, if you sure. want to uh, uh, email us, we'll try and get the answers for you. Uh, in, in the meantime, uh, I want to uh, present you with a ball cap. You have the ball cap? All right. Yeah, and, I get the ball uh, cap. I get the membership. Terrific. Uh, I'm much prized, dearly loved. I know we'll enjoy that. Okay. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, this program has been recorded. In a few days, it's going to be available on the YouTube channel or via our website. Thank you again, and good night. Thank you.